This is NJTV. Longtime U.S. Senator Frank Lautenberg has announced his retirement. We'll have reaction. Lawmakers consider whether to allow voters to decide if they want to raise the minimum wage. And here she comes again. The Miss America pageant is returning to Atlantic City. It's all ahead on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello and welcome to NJ Today. I'm Desiree Taylor. Mike Schneider is off tonight. Longtime U.S. Senator Frank Lautenberg has announced he will not seek re-election. The 89-year-old Democrat who was born in Patterson has been a public servant for decades. Lautenberg didn't state the reason for his decision in a statement issued today. Instead, he said, quote, I will be traveling to my hometown of Patterson tomorrow to announce that I will not seek re-election in 2014. This is not the end of anything, but rather the beginning of a two-year mission to pass new gun safety laws, protect children from toxic chemicals, and create more opportunities for working families in New Jersey. While I may not be seeking re-election, there's still plenty of work to do before the end of this term, and I'm going to keep fighting as hard as ever for the people of New Jersey in the U.S. Senate. Well, of course, reaction to Lautenberg's retirement has been pouring in from elected officials from Washington to Trenton. Assemblyman John Wisniewski, chairman of New Jersey's Democratic Committee, called him, quote, an extraordinary public servant. Governor Christie also issued a statement saying, quote, Frank Lautenberg and, and I have had our differences through the years, but I've always respected him for his tenacity devotion to the people of New Jersey and his love for and commitment to public service. I will always be grateful for his doggedness in fighting with me and the delegation to ensure congressional passage of an aid package after Hurricane Sandy that is delivering necessary assistance to our residents. I wish him the best in his retirement. Well, Lautenberg's decision not to run again will likely change the political landscape in New Jersey. Joining me now to share his insight and thoughts on Lautenberg's legacy and how his departure will impact the 2014 Senate race is my colleague, David Cruz. Hey, Des. David, quite an announcement today. Um, first, tell me, how did we get to this point? Well, you know, I think when, when we look back on all of this, we're all going to say it was all about Sandy, because if Sandy hadn't struck, then Chris Christie might not have been able to have his successful run of reacting to that, and then he might not have seen him as strong a uh, gubernatorial candidate, and Cory Booker might be running for governor right now, and Frank Lautenberg might not even have a challenger. But that said, it all started around December when Cory Booker decided that he wouldn't run for governor and decided that he would run for Senate in 2014, and that threw down the gauntlet. He didn't say, I, would, I will do it if Frank Lautenberg retires. He said, I'm going to run. And so that set up this challenge right now. And not sure whether Cory Booker's announcement forced Frank Lautenberg into retirement, but that's yeah. maybe something we'll find out tomorrow. Well, that is the question. Now, before Booker uh, expressed interest in this seat, um, there were reports stating that Lautenberg was considering retiring. And do you think Booker's announcement changed that? I'm not sure. I think we'll, we'll, uh, that's one of the questions we want to ask him tomorrow. I think that Frank Lautenberg is a very proud man. He is, uh, has served in the Senate and has even fought his own party when he's served in the Senate. And the, the, you refer to that New York Times report. He, his family kind of wanted him to retire. He is 89 years old, and he would be starting another term at age 90 or 91. Uh, and that's a six-year term, so that's a, a full agenda for someone who's uh, in his 90s. Um, but I think that when Booker made his challenge, uh, Lautenberg sort of retrenched, but then I think cooler heads prevailed in his inner circle, and he decided that, you know, maybe he'd want to spend his later years chilling. 
Okay, well, a likely candidate uh, in the U.S. Senate race, as you just mentioned, is Mayor Cory Booker. Now we have um, his reaction, not reaction specifically to today's announcement, but his thoughts about Senator uh, Lautenberg. Let's listen to a soundbite. As far as Senator Lautenberg, I have a lot of respect for the senator. He's a great senator. I respect his judgment. I respect his opinions. And most of all, I respect the great work he's done for the city of Newark, and I'm appreciative of it. Okay, so in that soundbite, much deference to Senator Lautenberg, but we all know um, that uh, Lautenberg has been taking some, some jabs at him lately. Um, what do, you th what do you think of uh, Booker's well, uh, I think that, that sound uh, came uh, yesterday from uh, Booker when reporters were asking him about Lautenberg, even before we, we knew that this was happening. And since he got that pushback, uh, Cory Booker, that is, uh, I think he has been uh, smart to be much more deferential to Lautenberg. And he has said that establishing this committee and so on was something that he needed to do, was required of him, and not any kind of indication that he was pushing Frank Lautenberg to make any decision. Interestingly, he didn't ever really say if Lautenberg didn't step down, whether he would go forward with his race anyway. Okay. Well, interesting stuff. I want to move on, though, David. We'll get back to you in a little bit. Next, I'd like to go to my colleague Michael Aaron in Trenton, our chief political correspondent who has been covering the minimum wage vote. But before we get to that story, Michael has reaction from Assembly Speaker Sheila Oliver. I certainly have gone on record that um, I would consider and explore uh, whether or not I wanted to pursue that Senate seat. I think that, uh, with, you know, with all due respect to uh, Mayor Booker, who I consider to be a colleague and a friend, um, I have gone on record and I've said there is no heir apparent to a seat. Everyone knows that this, the uh, mayor has demonstrated that he is a prolific fundraiser. He travels the length and breadth of this country. He has a million Twitter followers and he's got a number of Facebook friends. But at the end of the day, it's the 8 million people that live in New Jersey that cast a vote. Michael, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this uh, reaction from Assembly Speaker Sheila Oliver. Did it surprise you in any way? A little bit. Uh, she sounded today like she is throwing her hat into the ring. Uh, she says she's exploring it, and I, I'm sure she's not ready to declare a candidacy for an election still more than a year and a half away. But uh, she was very quick to accept our invitation to step off the podium in the assembly chamber and comment on this resignation. And she was very positive in saying that she thinks she's known statewide and thinks a woman should be in the U.S. Senate. So it's likely we, have, we may have some more candidates throwing their hat into this race. But before we get more into that upcoming race, I'd like to talk more about uh, Lautenberg's legacy. You've covered him over the years. Tell me your thoughts. I covered his first campaign for U.S. Senate in 1982. First of all, let me say that I don't think people in the political community really expected Lautenberg to run for re-election, Cory Booker or no Cory Booker. Uh, the senator is getting old. Uh, he was sick for about three weeks in December, a, a flu uh, kept him away from some important votes. At the chamber dinner in Washington, the Chamber of Commerce, about two weeks ago, uh, his voice was weak. Um, and he just seems to have been losing some steam over the last couple of years. Uh, that said, uh, he's had a stellar career. Uh, he comes out of the business world. He uh, was a founder of automatic data processing, highly successful. When he ran in 1982, he portrayed his Republican opponent, Millicent Fenwick, as uh, too old for the job. She was only about 75 at the time. Uh, he got himself known for uh, banning smoking on airliners and mainly on transportation issues. And he was also known as a very tough campaigner. He defeated Pete Dawkins, the All-American football player, in 1988. He defeated Assembly Speaker Chuck Hytine in 1994. He retired from the Senate once before in 2000, but hated retirement, so that when Bob Torricelli, whom we saw on NJ Today this week, uh, decided not to pursue re-election in 2002, and the party turned to Lautenberg, he was only too happy to step in. He beat Doug Forrester that year. He beat Dick Zimmer in 2008. And uh, everybody said Frank could always get as dirty as, it needed to, as he needed to get in order to hold on to his seat. Mike, uh, Michael, before you go, any personal uh, stories about uh, the senator 
any uh, personal stories, that interaction with him, uh, quotes or any experiences with him that you want to share? Uh, you know, when you say that, the first thing that comes to mind is that Frank Lautenberg donated the furniture at the old NJN building in Newark uh, years and years ago on Broad Street. Uh, we were a fledgling organization back then, and the very successful businessman who was quite a philanthropist and quite involved in pro-Israel causes uh, somehow had a whole lot of extra office furniture lying around ADP and uh, had it carted over to public television. Mm. Incredible. Michael, we thank you. I know that story well. I thank you and David Cruz, and uh, we're going to take a short break. other news, the full assembly this afternoon moved a minimum wage hike to the November ballot. Governor Christie vetoed a minimum wage bill last month. He wants to phase in a $1 increase over three years and remove in automatic cost of living adjustment. Democrats in both houses have now bypassed the governor by making it a constitutional amendment that goes straight to the voters. In the goodness of their hearts, they're going to vote for this ballot, uh, this referendum, and give people a minimum wage increase tied to the CPI, not realizing that that's not necessarily a good thing for our economy. We should not have to do it by way of constitutional amendment. Our governor should have signed the, signed the bill into law. That's how it should have been done, because it is the right thing to do. And one day, hopefully, he'll see clear to that, regardless of, what, regardless of what's going to happen when it goes before the people of the state of New Jersey. New Jersey's sports wagering law was put to the test in federal court today. At issue is whether the federal law restricting sports betting to four states is unconstitutional. Even if New Jersey loses this legal fight, sports gambling may not be a dead issue. That's if a proposal that Congressman Frank Pallone plans to reintroduce is approved, which would exempt New Jersey from the federal ban. And Congressman Frank Lobiondo plans to reintroduce a measure that would allow all states, including New Jersey, to enact laws legalizing sports betting until January. January 2017. Well, a major televised event that will help increase Atlantic City's profile on the national and international stage was announced today. The Miss America pageant is coming back to the boardwalk. Our Lauren Wonko has the story. It's back in Atlantic City, that famous wave, the crown. The Miss America pageant is returning to New Jersey this September. Just two days after Christmas, I got a call on my cell phone from the lieutenant governor saying, we hear your contract has expired in Las Vegas, and before you sign an extension, would you consider bringing this thing back to Atlantic City? Officials call it a shot in the arm for Atlantic City, a city they've been working to rebrand as a family-friendly resort getaway. We love the casinos in Atlantic City, but we love to make Atlantic City more of a destination for everyone. And that's why it was so important to us to bring the Miss America pageant back. Thousands of fans from every state in the nation are expected to descend on Atlantic City leading up to the pageant. Fans who are also expected to pump millions back into the local economy. We're going to have 20 uh, pre-production days and all kinds of events that lead up to the main event. And you know what that means, spending, visitation. I'll be guessing a little bit, but based on my experience with other economic development initiatives like this, I, I would expect that we'll have 20, 30 million dollars in impact uh, at a minimum. And Miss America could bring a much needed financial boost to the city's casinos. 20,000 rooms exist within the city. Most of them are within the casino campuses. So we, we expect that the casinos will benefit. Atlantic City, like so many other shore communities, is struggling to lure back tourists after Superstorm Sandy hammered the coast. But their greatest challenge isn't rebuilding. It's getting the message out that their boardwalk and casinos weren't damaged by the storm. This event, not only today, but the faith the pageant organizers have in the Jersey Shore and Atlantic City specifically will debunk the myth that the Jersey Shore is not open for business. The economic benefits are going to speak for themselves, but I think the message, the communications messaging as part of our public relations campaign is going to just be enormously important. As people still don't fully understand beyond the immediate region that we're open for business, that the boardwalk is open, that the casinos are all open. And so this will make that statement in bold script. The three-year agreement is expected to be finalized later this month. 
officials won't give any details on costs involved just yet. And the date of the pageant, set to take place in Boardwalk Hall, hasn't been scheduled either. But officials say this town is ready for the crown. In Atlantic City, I'm Lauren Wonko for NJ Today. Another struggling Atlantic City casino has been sold. Trump Plaza, the boardwalk centerpiece of Donald Trump's one-time Atlantic City empire, was bought by a California company for just $20 million. That's the lowest price ever paid for an Atlantic City casino. Despite the bargain basement cost, a Trump Entertainment Resorts official says the deal shows the Atlantic City market is still attractive to investors, given the right price. No word yet if Trump Plaza will get a new name or how the sale may impact the casino's 900 employees. Well, is Atlantic City's newest casino heading toward bankruptcy? That's the question Senate President Stephen Sweeney is asking casino regulators. According to the press of Atlantic City, Sweeney outlined his concerns about Rebel Casino Resort in a letter sent to the director of the Division of Gaming Enforcement. It comes after the agency revealed Rebel has secured legal help to restructure its $1.3 billion debt. A spokeswoman for the agency told the newspaper she's confident all steps are being considered to maintain Rebel's operations. Rebel's financial troubles forced it to seek more than $150 million in additional financing in December. We told you recently that FEMA has rejected Ocean Grove's request for help to rebuild its boardwalk. The decision has angered some residents and prompted New Jersey's DEP commissioner to meet with local officials today. The issue has also gotten the attention of Senator Jennifer Beck. She joins me now by phone. How are you, Senator? I'm doing great, Desiree. Oh. Thanks, for your, thanks for your time today. Sure. Now let's talk about this issue and why FEMA rejected this request. Now the request came from the Ocean Grove uh, Camp Meeting Association, which is a nonprofit ministry uh, group. Um, do you know why FEMA rejected this request? So FEMA, FEMA, who I have to tell you has been um, pulled throughout. You know they viewed this private not-for-profit is not fulfilling, fulfilling a governmental role. And that's really not the case here because Ocean Grove Camp Meeting Association owns um, all of the real estate literally from Main Street to the ocean. They own the boardwalk, the beach, and 2,000 feet into the water. And it has received and so funding in the they past. they actually operate like a small municipality within Neptune Township. And the boardwalk itself is actually critical infrastructure. It is um, critical to their emergency management response. Ambulances use it when they are responding to emergencies um, on Ocean Avenue and on the beach side. And frankly, when they're helping assist other towns, that's how they transport people town to town. Um, the lifeguards obviously use this as a staging area for their emergency response, and they literally rescue hundreds of thousands of people, um, especially in the last two years with the rip tides that we've had in the ocean. Um, this is a center for communication yeah. for their emergency system, and it is, frankly, a critical and essential element so a of that shore area. So as a result, um, because it's so critical, you're, you're are you are appealing this decision? The, the decision will absolutely be appealed, and I think some of the new information that we bring to light to FEMA as part of the appeal, I am very hopeful will change their decision making. Okay. Um, because in essence, as I said, this private not-for-profit functions like a quasi-government entity, and they hire their own lifeguards, they train their own lifeguards, they have their own emergency response, and on this beachfront, um, they provide public access the way every other municipality does up and down the coast. Okay. Well, so, we... We will continue yeah, to follow a, it's this. It's a really important piece for the Jersey Shore and, frankly, for our recovery as a community. Senator Beck, we thank you so much. Thanks. Great to talk to you. Some things in life are free. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. We begin in Wildwood, where one of the few free beaches in the state will remain that way. A plan to put a beach fee question before voters has been rescinded by officials. The decision comes as other shore towns hit hard by Superstorm Sandy are considering increasing beach fees. Our next stop is Newark, where dozens of couples tie the knot in the city's annual Valentine's Day mass wedding ceremony. 
Court judges and staff rotated to perform each ceremony. This year set a new record with 106 applications, including one civil union. And our final stop is Trenton, where some are asking, where's the love? That's because Foursquare, a social networking website, has ranked the state capital the least romantic city in the country. The ranking was based on the lack of romantic spots, such as French restaurants, wineries, and flower shops. In contrast, New York City and San Francisco were rated among the best, but not one New Jersey city made the top 10 list. And that's your Garden State Express for Thursday, February 14th. Governor Christie likely added a sizable amount to his growing war chest of more than $2 million for his re-election bid at his latest fundraiser. It was hosted by billionaire Facebook co-founder Mark Zuckerberg. Among the attendees was former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, but there were also about 40 protesters outside of Zuckerberg's home who took issue with the Republican stance on women's health funding. Among the Democrats calling for a number of safeguards to ensure the federal Sandy relief aid coming to New Jersey is spent wisely is Assemblyman Vincent Prieto. And one of his concerns is an apparent no-bid contract awarded to a Florida disaster recovery company with political ties here in the Garden State. Assemblyman Prieto joins me now from Trenton to talk about this and other issues. Sir, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Okay, first let's talk about Ashprit, this Florida-based uh, uh, recovery, disaster recovery firm. Um, the record is reporting that days after a multi-million dollar contract was awarded to this firm, that uh, it contributed $50,000 to the Republican Governors Association. Now, uh, according to the same report, uh, a company official said, well, that was a, a, a money for a, a membership. Um, but is this cause for concern? Well, the, the concern to, to me with Ashbridge, you know, they're a company that, you know, they're in business to, to make money. My, my concern has been the way the process has gone and that we have not gotten the, question, the, the questions answers uh, that, that we have. We have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, they actually piggybacked off a contract from 2008 in Connecticut, and that actually makes it a no-bid contract. And normally, no-bid contracts are, are more difficult to, you know, the, the scrutiny is greater uh, with them. We want to make sure that this money is spent uh, wisely, it's spent here, and that it would trickle back into New Jersey, and New Jersey companies should be able to be getting this money, and the money could stay here, and it could be a jump start to our economy. And because we've been in uh, difficult times. Now, you've been leading the effort calling for greater legislative, legislative oversight when it comes to the Sandy Relief Aid. Um, tell me, how do you expect to accomplish that? Well, uh, today um, we have a, a couple of bills up. One of them would be to, uh, to put integrity monitors in, in place that they would oversee the, the process. Uh, the treasurer would have the ability, you know, to place them, uh, and he would uh, have the ability also to waive them. But if he would want to waive them, he would have to give written notice to both the Senate president and the speaker why they would not be needed. Uh, um, history has shown that integrity monitors are very, very important because not only they find waste and fraud in the process, they actually deter people from trying to, you know, get by and, you know, uh, overcharging because they know that they're being watched. So I think that's a very important component um, uh, of this, you know, process. Now, you asked the state treasurer to uh, come to discuss this issue about uh, Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy uh, aid money to make sure it's spent wisely. Uh, what happened? And you seemed uh, quite displeased about what happened. Um, a little bit. Uh, we, we had asked the treasurer to come in and give us some information. Uh, we wanted to, to get a lot of questions answered. Uh, he has not. And, and you know, my, my displeasure has been that the treasurer, this is uh, the fourth time on three different topics. One of them was about the budget early on. The other was about privatizing the lottery. Now this is about the, the Sandy rebuilding, which I think is very important. It's issue number one for the state of New Jersey that we rebuild and it's in a, in a timely manner, and, but we have to make sure to see how this money is going to be distributed. We don't know exactly what the allocation for New Jersey is going to be. Is it going to need any legislative uh, um, uh, bills to, to be able to move some of this? Is it going to have joint oversight, you know, uh, from JBOC? Uh, we don't know. So these are questions that we wanted to pose to the treasurer. So I was very, very unhappy that he did not uh, come before us. And did he give you a reason? 
Uh, no, he uh, he could not make it. I only my biggest frustration was that we we got a phone call about an hour before the meeting, um, and and I just think is it was um, sort of disrespectful not only to the committee but uh, to the residents of the state of New Jersey that deserve an answer. And uh, you know we're an equal branch of government, and we need to be part of this process to make sure that things are being done properly. And that's why we're elected to represent the. Uh, the residents of the state of New Jersey, and I think we should be doing our job by asking these questions, whether they're tough questions or just basic questions. Um, let's switch gears and talk about internet gaming quickly. Uh, this issue is in court today. But uh, the question is, what do you think this will mean for Atlantic City? Well, ho hopefully this will be something that will spur uh, Atlantic City and it will give it uh, a little bit more life. You know, we depend so much on, the, on that industry uh, as a source of revenue for the state. Uh, and we've actually fallen back uh, to number three. We were number two always in the nation. Hopefully this is something that will help us. You know, we are in the 21st century. This is part of life where we are. So the Internet is here with us and we need to tap into uh, that industry from that angle. Ah, we'll be watching it closely. Assemblyman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's all for now. Tomorrow morning, we'll have live coverage of Lautenberg's official announcement. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Desiree Taylor. Have a good night. Next on NJTV, BBC.